Thanks, Sven. Great way not to put any pressure on me. Um, so let me start out first by, by saying this. I'm not an expert. That's actually been to my advantage the last time I did something like this, because when you're not an expert, it's pretty hard for you to lose your audience. I'm going to be hard-pressed to do that. So I'll really be trying to explain stuff to you. But what might happen is that you might notice that I make a mistake. If I do that, don't grin silently. Just raise your hand and correct me for the benefit of everyone, right? So I'd really be happy. In fact, I'd really actually be very, very happy if we got into a discussion. I have a number of topics that invite discussion, and I'd love to do that. I think that's one of the coolest things about blockchain and Bitcoin-related topics, that they always lead to discussions among the audience and speakers, because everybody has an opinion. I love that. Please do interrupt me. Don't hold your questions until the end. We we'll can just make it very interactive. Okay, so the topic I want to talk about is consensus. I was actually here in uh, Go to Amsterdam last year and did an introductory talk about Bitcoin and the blockchain itself. And this is a topic that I glossed over. I just briefly mentioned, yeah, there's this proof of work thing, but there are also others. But we're not going to talk about that because we don't have the time. So this time, that's all I want to talk about. I want to talk about consensus in various forms, and I want to explore this, um, this universe a bit with you. So let's get the basics out of the way quickly. A very first uh, basic thing is classical consensus, which does not concern us too much. I just want to lay it out at the beginning. So consensus is something, consensus in distributed systems is something that's been a topic of research for something like four decades. This is not something new. This is something people have researched in great detail. Um, and actually se several people got, uh, several people involved with, with this kind of research have Turing awards. So this is not, so that's the Nobel Prize in computer science, if you don't know. So the, this is actually a very important topic and a complicated topic. Classically, there was a, a foundational paper that talked about replicated state machines and gave people sort of the vocabulary to talk about this thing. It sort of formalized on how to reason about different kinds of consensus, which was a great thing because it enabled people to, well, don't invent consensus algorithms in an ad hoc fashion, but rather go about this in a very, very structured way and prove different properties of those things. And you probably all know a lot of classical consensus algorithms. The most well-known one is probably the two-phase commit protocol used in most relational databases. There's also something well, academically well-known, which, which is called view state replication. You probably all heard of Paxos if you studied computer science at one point in time. Um, there are num numerous ways of explaining it. I mean, there is, this is actually a whole family of consensus protocols um, with very varying degrees um, regarding the key properties of consensus. One thing that became very popular recently, maybe five years ago, was Raft, um, which is employed in a number of, of products. Um, it actually was intended to be a, a, a consensus protocol that's easy to explain, which I think is a great way to go, go about those things, right? Invent something that's easy to explain because it makes it much easier to reason about and you can actually get, uh, get feedback much quicker. This is actually something that's uh, now being used in a number of products, for example, in etcd and other um, products and tools that are employed in a distributed environment. When you're building a system with a distributed architecture, it's pretty likely that when there is a need for consensus, something like Raft or Paxos or a variant of it, like for example, Zab, which is the Zookeeper protocol, is employed. Maybe one of the key takeaways, I'm, gonna, I'm probably, probably going to come back to that at the end, is um, these are all things that are well documented, well researched, that have been criticized, which is why they're so good. You know, something like Raft is good. I'm confident to say that, not because I've personally analyzed it and, and convinced myself that I can't find any holes, because frankly, if I can't find any holes in that, that doesn't really mean anything. Right? But if the whole academic community can't find a hole in that thing, that actually says something about it. So the status here and these protocols and a number of related things is actually pretty good. Um, you can be pretty confident that you can rely on those things um, to, um, to fulfill their need. Interestingly enough, uh, uh, another consequence of that is if, if the consensus algorithm you're using is not one of those, you may have a problem, right? If the consensus algorithm has been invented by somebody on the fly because they thought about what, what could go wrong and then they wrote a number of exception handlers to deal with those problems, then it's very likely going to fail. If you want to look at some research in that regard, there's a fantastic uh, website called jepson.io by, uh, by or Afir, actually the starting point is Jepson, Afir is Kyle Kingsbury, a researcher who spends all of his time breaking databases. And he analyzes databases and shows how they break down when, uh, when they don't follow a decent consensus protocol. 
And that's, to me, the key, the key takeaway from this part. Essentially, one of the problems with classical consensus protocols is that they're really intended for a specific kind of environment, right? There is a, a theoretical um, difference between a synchronous and an asynchronous network and the, the thing in between, which is a partially synchronous network, and those, um, those uh, uh, kinds of networks lead to different properties of the consensus algorithms that you can run on top of them. But essentially, they're all kind of assuming a group of sort of well-known uh, people participating, collaborating, and potentially crashing, potentially uh, failing, right? That's, that's the kind of thing. And the two properties that people talk about in classical consensus algorithms are safety and liveness. We're going to come back to them later on, so I'm going to mention them now. Safety essentially is the same thing as consensus, right? Safety means you can rely on what the system tells you. If it tells you that A equals 2, then you can be pretty sure, no, you can actually be very sure that A equals 2, and that everybody else in the world will get the same answer. When they ask it for, for, its, um, for its value, they will get back 2 as the value for A. That's the arguably most important property when you're talking about a consensus protocol. There's also liveness, which is related to availability. Right? Liveness is essentially, does this thing move forward, or can it get stuck? Can it, can it arrive at a state where it can't continue anymore because it's waiting for something that, that, uh, does, that will never happen anymore? Right? So it sort of reminds us a bit of the CAP theorem. It's not the same thing, but it's sort of it's the same thing because it's a, it's a related thing because all the stuff we're talking about here is always related to the consensus part of things. Right? We all want to be on the CP side of things. We want to be in a system where we can rely on the information that we have here. Now, those things have been available for a long, long time. They're very active. They're also very practical in their, in, uh, they're practically applied. This is not just theoretical thing a theoretical thing that's actually actively in use. Now, one of the problems here is um, that these systems can't handle Byzantine failures. A Byzantine failure is, uh, gets its name from a famous paper written by one of the inventors of Paxos, essentially one of the fathers of computer science, Leslie Lampert, who was talking about this in a, in a paper um, where essentially the problem that we're trying to solve is a number of generals that want to attack a city. So this city's been under siege for a while, and now those generals have to make a decision whether, the, whether or not they want to attack. Obviously, if they all attack at the same time, that's much better as if one of them thinks all the others will attack and tries to, and then gets defeated, because they're the only general trying that, right? So that's essentially the goal here. You want all of those generals to agree. Now, the problem is they're separated, they're spread out across, around the city, and they have these, uh, these messengers riding horses, um, who may or may not arrive at their destination. So you have the problem that, that some of them might fail. That's essentially basic crash failure, right? In the purest sense of the word. If they crash, they won't arrive, but they also might have bad intentions. Right? So some of them might actually lie to you. They might, might not really have been sent by that general, or they might have been bribed to tell you something wrong. So you're now facing people who intentionally want to mislead you. And they do that with all of the knowledge of the protocol that you've just developed. You can imagine that's a much harder problem than getting people basically to agree. I mean, that's hard enough, right? Getting people to agree isn't easy even if they want to agree. But if one of them really wants to sabotage the whole thing, this is really, really a hard problem. So we arrive at Byzantine failures with actors that are not only unreliable, but also malicious, erroneous and malicious. That can get you elected president of the United States, but it also poses a problem to, to consensus-based systems. Again, nothing is fail-safe, right? If everybody agrees to do the other thing, then maybe you can't even talk about treason, right? Maybe that's just the majority decision, that if everybody wants to maybe not attack or you know, uh, become part of the other party, that, that's fine, but how many traitors, how many malicious actors can you tolerate? That's sort of the key question in those, in those things. Now, Byzantine failures were introduced in a paper in the 80s, and that was a, an active area of research for a decade or so because nobody was able to solve it. That tells you a lot about the complexity of this particular problem. The first people to solve it were, again, Turing Award winners, or at least one of them, right? Which, was, um, Bar is, which is Barbara Liskov. Um, and um, she actually implemented a, a scheme or described a scheme called practical Byzantine fault tolerance, which was an algorithm or is an algorithm that actually arrives at consensus, if none, not more than a third of the actors are malicious, can still guarantee that consensus is achieved. 
which is a pretty cool thing. And this is also something that is implemented in practice, but it wasn't used for a long time. It was there, but it was mostly of academic interest, right? Nobody really did anything with it. With it. There were some universities implementing it, and there's this one implementation that everybody talks about. I haven't actually used it, but people have, have been doing that for a long time. Now, still, Byzantine fault tolerance and practical Byzantine fault tolerance um, still has some problems that, does that make it not a perfect solution for our universe that we'll, we'll be talking about soon. One of the problems with PBFT is its complexity, its, its scaling, right? So it'll require n squared, around the order of n squared messages to be sent among n participants. That's quite a bit. If you think of a million participants, you can pretty much rule out that this is ever going to be usable for anything, right? So you can't just do PBFT on a million devices. Right? The other thing is the, all the assumptions in there are based on the fact that the group is known. You know who is participating. You know some of them might be malicious, but at least you have an idea that this, it's going to be these 50 people who are going to have a vote here, right? That's one of the problems here. Any questions so far? Any comments? Please, again, feel free to interrupt. Okay. So we had PBFT for a while. I was thinking it was in the 90s. Don't, does it say that? In 1999. Um, it was around for a while. Um, and then somebody solved the problem in a different way. And that different way was introduced by Satoshi Nakamoto with the introduction of Bitcoin and the blockchain. Now, I'm, I'm pretty sure that everybody here knows how Bitcoin and the blockchain work. Can you please confirm that? Does anybody not know how Bitcoin and the blockchain work? Okay, so it's two or three people. I'll, I'll do the 60 second intro here, right? So we have all of those things in a Bitcoin blockchain. Again, you can use it as a, uh, as a, as a chance to check whether I'm saying something stupid here. We have all of those things in the Bitcoin universe, just to take one example or the most well-known example of a blockchain-based system. We have something that um, is actually the name of the thing and the currency, which is true for all cryptocurrencies. They have, a, they have a name of the thing that they actually do here. And Bitcoins, everybody knows what that is because everybody wanted to get rich at one point in time, are the currency handled in the Bitcoin universe. Then we have something that actually deals with the actual transactions happening here, right? So we have a wallet, which is essentially a store for private keys um, that allows you to generate a public key or an address that people can then use to send you money, send you Bitcoin. They do that in the form of transactions, right? That's what happens. There's a transaction that says, I'm using something that I haven't spent yet to spend on this particular thing. And then maybe I get some change back, and there's also a little fee that goes to somebody who makes money off the whole thing. All of those transactions, the actual things happening there, then get aggregated to a block, or they are referenced from a block. And that block actually um, is the key thing here that um, is validated. It's actually the block that we need to get consensus for, right? We need to be sure that this is actually what's in the block. The block references the transactions by means of a hash over their content, so essentially, we can be very sure if we have a block with all of the hashes of all of the transactions that it refers to that this block hasn't been tampered with. Still, we need to agree which blocks are the, the valid ones we want to accept because there are many potentially valid blocks, but we only want to agree to one version of reality. We want to get consensus on the whole thing. The participants in this, in this thing are the nodes. So the nodes are all the computers relaying transactions. Some of them may be mining. Some of them uh, may be just uh, uh, storing parts of the blockchain. And the blockchain, of course, is that thing that is built when you chain all of those blocks together. So in Bitcoin, other blockchains, there is something called the Genesis block, which is the beginning of history. And then every block after that references the previous block, and again, the previous block, and again, the previous block. Right? So how long did that take me? It was probably 90 or 120 seconds. Right? So I apologize for that. So that's essentially what, what, uh, what we now view as part of, um, or the, the key parts of the Bitcoin system. And one of the key ideas here is the Nakamoto consensus, right? The inventor of Bitcoin, Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever that was, who knows, um, actually came up with this idea. And this is how Bitcoin manages to agree on things, right? Bitcoin does it using um, a probability-based scheme. So you can never be 100% sure, but you can, close, can be close to 100% sure, so close that it doesn't matter that it's not 100%. And the way it does that is by relying on the fact that it's very hard to create blocks. 
And because a block references a previous block, which references a previous block, which references a previous block, and so on, it becomes incredibly hard to create a, 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 a fa false version of history if something is a long way in the past. If something happened 100 blocks ago, then it would be incredibly hard for me to come up with an alternate version of reality that had a different variant of one of the transactions within those blocks. And the reason for that is that um, it's hard to create blocks. It's the key thing here. It's got to be really, really hard and expensive and maybe wasting something. We'll get to that. Right, so. so essentially, in practice, when you look at Bitcoin, after something is, um, is six blocks away, um, you consider it basically immutable, right? Six blocks will take you 60 minutes. So after an hour, you can be sure that something really has happened. That sounds like a lot of time. An hour just seems like a lot. But in fact, if you look at the banking system that we currently have, if I do a bank transfer, a SIPA transfer in the EU, I can, I think, take it back after a couple of days. Or if I do a credit card tr a payment transaction, I can, I can claim I never did that. And the, or if I do a PayPal kind of thing, I can say that I Never, never intended to do that, whatever. I, I have lots of ways of doing that. I have no such thing in the Bitcoin blockchain. Now, the way these things are, the, these blocks are created, mean that there are, con uh, that there are competing blocks. Multiple people uh, on, in the world create blocks. Those blocks essentially um, uh, are appended to the chain, and then the longest chain wins. Now, that is actually what's closest to consensus here, right? That's the, that should be really what people should be thinking about. People are thinking about the proof of work part as the consensus part, but it's actually a mixture of those two things, right? In fact, the, uh, the, the, the key idea here is that, there in, uh, that at the end, there can only be one version of reality, one single linear blockchain with referencing blocks. And if it forks, it only ever does so for a very limited amount of time before one of the forks gets pruned off again, and it's clear which one the main chain is. The way that works is that if I get a, get a block, if I'm a miner, if I'm somebody who creates blocks, and I'm doing my best to find a solution to the riddle we're going to get to soon, if I'm trying to mine a block and somebody sends me another block, then I can just make a decision whether I want to continue anyway, or far more likely, throw my block away and try to build a new one on top of the block that I just received. And the way I will do this when I get multiple blocks is I will pick the one with the highest probability of ending up as the right solution. So I will pick the longest chain. Did that make sense? Do you all look non-confused? OK, good. You probably all knew that. So the way this is done in, in, in the Bitcoin network is um, using the proof of work thing. I'm not going to go into too much detail explaining hashing. I did that last time. So a hashing algorithm essentially takes some input and creates an output. The key idea here is that if I change only a single bit in the input, the output will be vastly different, right? That's the property of a hashing function. And another property is that I can never go back. I cannot take a hash and find a way to, to sort of get back to the original content. Um, and that actually allows um, for uh, what Bitcoin uses as its, um, as its proof of work algorithm. So Bitcoin Validation requires that you find a solution to a, a riddle, and that riddle is basically given an input text with a little variation at the beginning, find a result that starts with a number of zeros. Simplifying a little, but that's essentially what it is, right? So I, I need to hash something, and I need to come up with a value that starts with a number of zeros, and the only way I can do that is by varying a little thing called a nonce, um, in the beginning here. So here, in that part at the beginning, there is something that I can change. And if I change it by the way that I, by, in the way that I described it just earlier, the result will be different. And if I change it again, the result will again be different. But it's completely unpredictable. I have no idea how to vary this input value to come to that result that I need. Right? There's a huge number of those results, but I have no way of reliably finding out how to do that other than trying them out. So I try and try and try and try in a brute force way until I have found a solution to that riddle. That is something that I need to do to, um, to create a valid block. And that means that in a proof of work based blockchain system, of which Bitcoin is just one example, there will be, be a lot of computers in the world and a lot of special chips in the world just computing the same thing over and over again, essentially logically the same thing with different input, input values. And the first one who finds a block the first one who manages for a 
set of transactions and a nonce that they invented to come up with such a solution will advertise that to the world and tell everyone, well, I've got a block, and hope that everybody agrees that this is the right block because then they will get a re reward for creating their block. They will get newly minted Bitcoin. Is that understandable? Isn't yes, there, please. Isn't there a statistics, uh, so there are a number of guys coming up with a block? Mm -hmm. Right, so there's, uh, the, the, the question is, how, what happens if a number of people come up with such a block? Who gets the money, right? What's the, what's the rule there? And the fact is, the f one of them wins, and the w which one of those it is depends on how fast, how fast they're able to get their block onto the network, um, how, how, how good the network connection is, and who ends up getting the this, uh, support of the others first. So you can't predict it. Statistically, it'll happen to you as well if you manage to create blocks in essentially a reasonably fast enough fashion, right? which is sort of the critical thing. It used to be, when, when Bitcoin started out, that you were able to mine Bitcoin using your computer. Right? You would just run the mining algorithm on your laptop. In fact, we have a colleague that did that back then, and I'm pretty sure he lost the, the hard drive that had those few Bitcoins that he mined just for fun. Um, of course, if you look at the kind of thing that we were doing here, then you can imagine that different kinds of CPUs might be better at certain kinds of riddles, right? So, for example, a GPU might be a good decision for some kind of proof-of-work algorithm. Now, um, that's actually something that we still have at our disposal, right? Every one of us has a, has a GPU in their pocket, and we also have a GPU in our, in our computers. So we could, pu could put both to work and let them figure out how to get to a block. But of course, this is not the fastest thing that you can do, right? There is something called a field programmable gated array, which is essentially a chip that, or well, it's a collection of chips. It's sort of a chip building kit where some of the things that are typically done in a chip building factory with a manufacturer can actually be done by the end user in the field. That's why it's called a field programmable kind of thing, right? So you, you could employ one of that. But essentially, once you're doing that, you can you can go the full way and just do an, a special device. This is an application-specific circuit. It's actually built for only one thing. And sure enough, what happened was that very specific processors came out whose only purpose in the world is to do Bitcoin mining, nothing else. In fact, those are the fastest c CPUs in the world, so, so to speak. It's, they're, the most, they're the densest. Nothing drives density in computing platforms as much as greed for Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies, because it's such a great way to make money. It's a fantastic way to make money. In fact, it's such a great way to make money that the manufacturers of those chips, some of them at least, keep them to themselves. Because it's much better not to sell them to the general public, but use them to mine X coin and then sell them off to the public, right? After you've sort of done that for a year, if you're the first one to do that, you can make a shit ton of money doing that kind of stuff, right? So it's very tempting to do that. There have also been cases of people um, just not selling that stuff. So there are Chinese manufacturers, and it's, not nothing, it's nothing to do with China, it could be in any country, just, ha just happened to know that from one, from one story that a Chinese manufacturer refused to sell a certain number of ASICs um, and uh, the assumption was very clear that they were keeping them to, them to themselves and didn't want to have a competing miner with, a s with similar power, so re they refused to fulfill certain orders here. Yes, please. Is that still the case with the cost of electricity? Now, we'll get to that in a second. So the question was about the cost of electricity, right? So that's an important thing. Let me get to briefly through this, and then we'll, I think that's probably the next slide. So we have a number of algorithms here. This is what, what Bitcoin does. It does its double SHA-256, but there are numerous other algorithms, some of which are actually um, intended to be hard to do on an ASIC. So some of these algorithms have properties that make them harder to implement on a special purpose processor than others, which is essentially uh, done because the, the inventors or the people behind that particular uh, uh, blockchain or cryptocurrency system don't want to have just people who are able to afford those things to be able to mine coins or create coins. But you want, you want to be able to have everybody participate in that type of stuff. Okay? Good. So I think, I don't know, I can't remember off the top of my head, I think X11 is used by Dash. ETH is ob obviously Ethereum. I can't remember who uses S-Crypt. What, which one was that? Litecoin. Litecoin. Yes, exactly, Litecoin. So, whatever. A number of those. Um, now, let's get to that energy, energy discussion, right? Because I know everybody, everybody has that, that on their mind. So, I've tried to approach it from two different sides because I'm completely ambiguous about the whole thing. 
drives me crazy. I like to have strong, clear opinions, and I just can't make up my mind. So I'm going to present two different cases to you, and then you can tell me which one sounds better to you. So the first one is, this is a catastrophe, right? What we're doing here is killing our planet for nothing, right? This is completely stupid. We have a continuously increasing demand for energy, energy just for Bitcoin. And of course, all the other public proof of work uh, blockchains have exactly the same problem, right? Because they waste computing power. I looked it up. The Netherlands uses about 116 billion kilowatt hours per year. 106 billion, so that's 106 terawatt per year. And Bitcoin uses 65. I mean, that's all of the Netherlands, right? Does that seem reasonable? Does that seem in any way reasonable to anybody? Now, I doubt that number. I don't think 65 is the correct number. I, I hate the fact that everybody who talks about Bitcoin energy always refers to the same source. It all leads down to one particular person writing a lot of blog posts and articles and getting quoted everywhere. So I was really annoyed at them and tried to calculate. And the way I calculated is was by starting with the number of hashes an ASIC can do. So you can buy ASICs for Bitcoin mining and they, give you, they quote you a number of uh, hashes per second per watt. So you can just assume that everybody uses this particular ASIC and then calculate the other way around. And I arrived at maybe 10 terawatt hours, which is clearly the same order of magnitude. So it doesn't really matter, you know, even if it's not 65% uh, of the Netherlands e electricity, even if it's just 10% that or five, that sounds like an awful lot to me. Right? That's not good. You can argue that it's little to no value. What's the value for human society that Bitcoin brought? Now, I think you're probably more on the enthusiast side of things than the skeptic side of things, but if you've talked to people, you know that this is an opinion very strongly held. I've had people block me on Twitter because I talk positively about Bitcoin. Right? So the mere fact that you do that means you're an idiot. Right? They argue that, obviously, this will lead to the use of cheap and dirty energy sources, right? like, like coal, dirty coal or whatever, you know, something that where it's really cheap, where, where environmental laws don't protect anything, and we can just use whatever you want just to produce those stupid uh, uh, proof-of-work uh, things. And also, because of the ASICs, you have a ton of completely useless hardware in two years, because you can only use them for a very limited amount of time. As soon as the proof-of-work algorithm changes, you can throw them away, unless they're programmable, but that makes them not as fast, so it's pretty hard to find the right spot in here between those extremes, right? And if they're really high, per high performance specific for a particular purpose, then they had served no value after they've outlived their, their mining life. Now, that's the negative side of things, right? And as I mentioned, I'll also try to do the positive side of things, which is this is not a big deal, right? We're all, this is all completely wrong. Now, I'm going to present the other, the other position. Um, essentially, demand will not increase linearly. This is, this is stupid. What, there's no reason to assume that it will just go like this. Maybe it'll go like this. You know, if you had predicted what the internet would look like with using the protocols and the style of things it used in the 1990s, it would not be able to run a network that spans the globe with billions of users. So obviously, Bitcoin and this are going to change, right? They're going to become more efficient, more reasonable. So the idea that by the year 2025, 80% of the world's electricity will be consumed by Bitcoin is just completely stupid. And I can agree with that. Now, it's more useful than Christmas lights. That's a favorite example that Andreas Antonopoulos, one of my favorite Bitcoin people, likes to, likes to uh, uh, give, because it's completely pointless to illuminate nothing for no reason whatsoever, right? Especially, you get extra, you get extra credibility if you don't believe in a higher uh, imaginary being of some kind. But if you do, even if you do, maybe you don't want to you know, honor them with lighting, who knows? Whatever, so you could argue that. You could also say that um, one of the problems of the, of the blockchains, specifically Bitcoin, uh, or also the other public blockchains, is that they make it so transparent. You can see how much energy they consume. You can't see how much energy the banking system consumes. With all of those skyscrapers that are lit at night and all of the people driving to work in two and a half ton vehicles and you know all of the, all of the printing of money and all of the all of the electricity required to run all of the data centers of all of the competing institutions in the world that would no longer be needed if we all just agreed on one of the PUW blockchains, right? So maybe that's another thing, we, can, we could just agree on one of them, and maybe in the end, the economy will drive us to that point where it's just one of them because we can't afford to run a hundred of them. 
And you can also argue that, in fact, it's, uh, it's much smarter to use clean energy. It's super smart to do this in a place where energy is cheap, essentially where it costs nothing, where you just generate it from solar or wind or whatever, right? Where you have zero environmental impact. Or you could put energy that would have been wasted otherwise to use to create trust in a, in a blockchain system. And of course, the ASIC-resistant algorithms, that could be an argument against the, the wastefulness of creating chips that nobody will use anymore. I don't actually buy that because it, uh, past experience is any indication. It's shown that it takes about two years until there is an ASIC that will actually be able to do whatever was supposed to be ASIC-resistant. Right? So this is just such like an arms race of manufacturers versus uh, scientists, computer scientists to come up, try to come up with algorithms. Again, I'm not too, I don't know exactly. So, did anybody change their mind? Probably not, but that's fine. Right? It's just, I think it's, a, I think it's a complicated thing. Okay, so let me get back to the, uh, to the, to the original topic. So, we're talking about problems to solve here. Um, actually, it's a little more complicated. If we, we tend to conflate a number of different things, right? And this is hard to do because um, different blockchain systems, some of them not even uh, reasonably called blockchain anymore, um, solve different overlaps of problems differently. So one is transaction validation. You have something that the blockchain does for you, right? There is, for example, it helps you to send money from A to B, but it could also be running a program or um, doing identity validation or, I don't know, whatever. Like, there are tons of things that the blockchain system could do for you, right? That's, a, that's one thing, and that might, might require some sort of validation, a consensus, a public, private key, cryptography, whatever, some kind of thing. Then there is what you could call committee selection. So if you, if you look at the problem of, of scaling these algorithms, then one of those things could be to um, have a subset of the people decide. Remember this n squared property of the PBFT thing, right, where you have so many people need to agree that it becomes completely prohibitive to have all, everybody participate? Maybe you can let just a, a, sub, a subset of people participate in that decision, right? And you have to, con you have to select who, d who does that, right, if you do such a thing. Then we have the actual consensus in the classical sense of the word. Consensus about the outcome of a transaction or the outcome of a block validation, if that's, if that's your strategy. But we also need to come to consensus about changes to the whole mechanism, right? We operate this blockchain thing. So how do we govern it? Who decides if there's a change to the proof of work algorithm? That could be external or it could be internal. It could be factored into the system. It could be part of the system to come to consensus to those things as well. Right? Those are all related but different problems. Then we could solve all of them or just parts of them. And similarly, we have this distinction between permissioned and public ledgers, which is also not as easy as it seems at first sight. Right? When I started out, and when I my personal journey, this whole thing, I had a very simple belief, which was that we have these untrusted, unknown people collaborating anywhere, you know, the Bitcoin world. And we had the um, trusted, known people. And that, to me, was the permission world. And I never got that. Because to me, the right solution here is a database. Right? If I know everybody, if I trust everybody, why would I waste my mental energy on coming up with a blockchain-based solution? That seems to make no sense at all. But it took me a while to get that. That's not really the point. Well, uh, maybe, maybe some people who really, well, maybe a lot of people who really should be using a database are using a blockchain because using a blockchain is cool. But I think there is some middle ground here. So, for example, you might end up in an environment where you know the people who participate, but you don't trust them. Or at least not 100%. You trust them reasonably well, but not really well. So, maybe you don't want to get put one of them in charge, and give them control over the, the central database, maybe you want to have some sort of agreement and some governing rule that has, makes all of them agree to something. Maybe that's not a bad thing at all. Maybe that's where you could position at the moment something like Ripple. This is really critical because everybody has their own use cases, right? So Ripple is one of the things that uh, has a, s a concept of validators. At the moment, those validators are mostly Ripple validators operated by the company that owns the, or that runs that particular blockchain, but their plan is to have others participate as well, and they want to select them in an intelligent fashion. You could also do that more dynamically, right? I used for, used to, I looked for a word here, I used joined as, the, as something in between known and, uh, known and unknown. Um, so you still don't trust people, but you want them to be able to join on their own. It should be open, right? Maybe open is the right word. You want, you want to be open to anybody to participate, um, 
but um, you want to have some mechanism to govern how that happens, right? That would be something like Dash, which has the concept of master nodes that do exactly that. So again, that's a very complicated, a complicated uh, uh, landscape of, of uh, needs and opportunities here. Right? Okay, so we talked about uh, we talked about proof of work. Let's talk about some of the alternatives. Um, and here the problem is that there are so many alternatives that I could bore you to death with the rest of that presentation just by listing all of them, right? In fact, if you look at the big cryptocurrency uh, portals, there are a number of portals that allow you to compare cryptocurrencies. Um, you can select the algorithms that they use for consensus and possibly proof of work as one of the criteria to sort them by. You have 2,000 currencies and you can sort them in different ways just based on that. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go over the, the most important ones. Now, the one that most people associate with or think of first is proof of stake. Even proof of stake isn't that simple. It's a complicated thing with lots of variants, right? So essentially the idea here is that what you what you commit, what you enter into the system, what, me what, what measures the metric by which to judge whether you're actually honest is not the amount of energy that you've wasted or invested, if you don't like that term, right? So in, in Bitcoin, I can prove, because I have this valid block, because I came up with it, I can prove that I invested the time and money to set up that mining rig and put in all the electricity and calculate that result. And that is actually, that's a pretty strong statement. I invested all of that. It would, be, would have been very stupid of me to cheat, right? And you can trust me because here's the proof. I wasted that. And essentially, in proof of stake, you uh, use the current or parts of the currency in the, in the broadest term here, parts of the, th the thing, the stake you have in the system is proof. I have no point in, in actually uh, cheating here because I own part of that thing. Why would I cheat myself? Right, so you have, it's your, essentially, um, your vote is determined based on the stake you have in the thing you're voting about. Okay, now, that is, a, that is a broad thing and there are a number of different ways of doing that. The most well-known thing at the moment right now probably is the use of proof of stake or the planned use of proof of stake in uh, Ethereum. Now, Ethereum has a two-step strategy. There is something on the horizon which is called Casper, which is a pure proof of stake kind of thing. The problem is at the moment Ethereum uses proof of work. And you can't just switch it from day one to day two to go with a different algorithm for a number of reasons. The most important one is that nobody really knows whether proof of stake is going to work. Right? So the, 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 the interesting thing is we do know proof of work works. Right. We're not 100% sure about proof of stake yet. So one of the ideas in Ethereum is to gather experience by running it at the moment as a secondary thing that will sort of um, validate every 100th block using an intermediate thing called Casper, the, the friendly finality gadget. That's an algorithm that describes how it will coexist with proof of work in the existing Ethereum system. I believe it's been, it's been released or it's supposed to be released any day now, so it's very close to, to actually be being put into, put into production. And after a while, this is the plan is to, tra to transition to something else. Now, proof of stake has a number of potential problems, right? A number of potential attacks. One of them is that um, if it's not really, if you're not really putting something at stake, not, you're not, if you're not investing energy, you could just use your money to vote for a number of possible blocks, right? You just you just say, well, I'm going to vote for all of those things, and some of them will actually end up being valid, and then I, I'll, I will profit from that. So you don't, you're not really putting anything at stake, right? because it's just virtual money, it's not real money, which is sort of kind of a weird thing to say, but the, that's, that would be the idea here. And you can, you can uh, mitigate that attack or that, that, that thing by making sure that if somebody cheats, they lose money. Right? So if I do that, if I, if I put my money into 100 blocks and only one of them gets selected, then maybe 99 of them are lost, or if I cheat in some other way, there are numerous ways of doing that. The other kind of, kind of attack in a proof of a stake system is called a long-range attack, which essentially means that you forge history so long in the past that it doesn't matter to you because you've extracted your money by then. Right? So I've exchanged my virtual crypto money into dollars or euros or something running on some other chain. Now I don't really care about the past stakes, and if I can use them, I can forge the past at a time where these transactions hadn't happened yet, right? So to do that, you have to have some way of, of making sure that doesn't happen. One way of doing that is actually having a secondary system of finality, which is exactly the finality part in Casper, the friendly finality gadget, because this doing every 100 block will ensure that it's actually um, uh, anchored in the blockchain down below. Lots of other examples of doing that. I'm 
sure I pretty much said that. Um, there is an interesting uh, choice here in the way of kind of way of doing things. The one I just described is sort of on-chain. So you combine this, um, you actually do it on the blockchain. You do, um, you do uh, a proof of stake and you actually make sure that, um, that, you, uh, that you base everything that you do on, an, on, an, on the classic, or almost classical underlying blockchain me mechanism now. The other way is you do it uh, using r r or falling back to one of the other things, like for example PBFT. PBFT was one of those things that you could use for a subset of, of, of uh, nodes, right? Remember that was the, the practical Byzantine fault tolerance, and you could use that to um, select a number of of, uh, of people to participate, maybe for a while, maybe for like um, the next 10 minutes. It's going to be these 200 or. 50 nodes that, that decide what, what's going to be the truth, and I write the decision that it's these 50 to the, to the blockchain, um, but then they can just do PBFT or something other that's reliable and fast and proven um, and can actually do that. That's actually a choice of safety over liveness or liveness over safety. What, what is more important to you, that the system doesn't halt or that it's always 100% correct? Right? And the choice here that, that most, most practical things make is the first one, like in the, in the cap thing as well. That's proof of stake. Um, there are variants of that. Um, not going to go into all of them. Um, going to skip to something that's very similar to proof of stake. You could arguably call it proof of stake as well, which is called proof of service. Um, that essentially means that what you do is you um, you um, don't invest energy outside of the system. You don't invest just the crypto thing. You invest something more like work, other kind of useful work that you do. There are certain things that the blockchain might require of its participants to function. Right? Like somebody has to relay messages, somebody has to validate things, somebody has to, I don't know, keep lists of things. That's something that uh, the Dash uh, uh, cryptocurrency actually does. That's actually, to me, one of, the, one of the conceptually most interesting. I don't know about the business side of things, I have no idea how well they do financially, I don't really care but I find them interesting from an organizational perspective. They have sort of embraced the DAO model. If you remember that from the Ethereum things, that's a distributed autonomous organization. The idea here is that there is no foundation or corporation or, uh, or anything like that that manages this cryptocurrency. It's actually completely open to anybody. If you want to, you can become part of this thing by running a master node. That's something you, there's, a, there's a guide on what to do if you want to run a master node. The key problem here is you need to have access to a number of 2,000, a uh, 1,000 dash, which is a little over 200,000 euros at the moment. So it's not something that you do as a hobby. But if you pool resources with somebody else, or if you join some sort of pool, you could do something like that. And essentially, dash is the same thing as Bitcoin. Conceptually, everything's exactly the same, plus the addition of master nodes. And these master nodes now do useful things. For example, they have two additional commands, two additional actions that you can do in the Dash network, which is to do what they call an instant send, which is a fast payment transaction that will be validated in the number of seconds. And that's actually done by the master nodes, only the master nodes. And they've put their 1,000 um, Dash at stake to vouch for, for their seriousness and their honesty. And they can only participate as long as they have that. If they fall below that threshold, they get thrown out of the network. And they form this fast thing to do the instant send, as well as the private send, which is their way of mixing things up so that it becomes anonymous. Right? So it adds those two things. It's actually, I think, a pretty, pretty fascinating kind of thing. And then an interesting thing is that they spread the rewards. So the, the, the rewards for, for mining are not just spread uh, among, or they don't go 100% to the um, to the miner who successfully mined a block. Uh, instead, that miner only gets 45%. 45% go into, uh, are spread along the, uh, the master nodes, actually selected at random. Some of them will get some, some money back. And 10%, that's fascinating, are put into a fund that's used for development, right? for proposals, for anything. Anybody can propose anything. And the master nodes will vote on this proposal, and then the, 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 actual, the, the DAO will fund, for example, the development of something. So it's really a completely uh, an autonomous kind of thing, a very fascinating concept. That's proof of service. Um, another interesting alternative is proof of capacity, uh, also known as proof of storage or proof of space. Um, that essentially says you don't prove to me that you have computing power by using it. You prove that you have space. 
you prove to me that you have hard disk availability. In fact, there was a paper a while ago that tried to combine that with storing files. I don't know whether if, if there anything ever came out of that, but that was an interesting combination. The only user I found of that is Burst, but I may be wrong here. There may be more coins doing that, and Burst itself is a pretty new one. It was there for a while, and then it went essentially dead, and now it's back again. It has a nice-looking website, but you have to be very careful because every coin has a nice-looking website because they have so much money, right? That's the, the cheapest thing at the moment. The idea here is that, that you pre-compute something, and then I can ask you to prove that you pre-computed it. And the way to do that is just that you store it, and then I, when, I, when I ask you that question, you have to give me the answer so fast that I can be sure that you haven't computed it on the fly which is also not as easy, right? Try to think of, an, of something that matches that description. It's not something that's easy to do, which is why it has a complicated name, which is, uh, the sample here is just a heart to pebble graph. If you don't know what that is, don't worry. Um, so it's, yeah, some graph riddle that you have to, so it doesn't matter, right? Now, um, the last P of something thing I have is proof of elapsed time, um, just to get the list complete, and that is um, something that's called a proof of elapsed time because it essentially uh, replaces the proof of having hardware, hard disk, or uh, CPU by proving that I have a certain kind of chip, um, which is a nice, a nice idea if, you, if you're a chip vendor. So Hyperledger has, a, has ma ma many variants. One of them is called Sawtooth, backed by Intel, and they have uh, something called uh, SGX, uh, which is sort of an enclave like the one you have in your phone for secure computing, for trusted computing. And you can actually ask that to um, do something for you, and then it'll prove that it has done that for you. And the thing they do here is essentially ask the thing to wait for a while. And if you can prove that you've asked it to wait for a while and you waited for a while, that's almost as good as if you had kept the CPU busy by computing something. But it wastes a lot less energy. Right. Problem, key problem here, of course, is that um, you're relying on a certain chip, right? On trust, on that vendor and on the availability of that particular thing. So whether that's your thing or not probably depends on how, how comfortable are you are with that, with that idea. Okay. So I'm going to skip very, very quickly over the last one because I'm out of time. So there are a number of those. Um, this one is, is interesting, I think, as used by Ripple. Um, uh, there's actually... An the story is more interesting than the actual algorithm. So the algorithm has, has, uh, overlapping, has the concept of overlapping unique node lists, so I trust 20 people, you trust 20 people, as long as they have an overlap of X percent, they can make a decision and we both will trust them. That was like this 10-second version of the whole thing. The interesting thing here is the science part of it. So that was a, an algorithm that um, actually was published in a paper and then somebody did some research and said, well, the claims in the paper are wrong. I can prove that it doesn't have the tolerance for whatever X percent, um, it only has Y percent. It claims to, uh, to rely only on 20% overlap and it required 90. Right? So actually, it was, it was set to do 20. They proved it was 60, and then the people who wrote the original paper looked back at it, did their own analysis, and said, okay, it's even worse. It's 90%. And they proposed a new one, which, call, which is called Cobalt. And that to me shows scientific work really, really succeeding, right? Because you were very public with your result, you describe it, you show it to everyone, it gets analyzed, people cite it, people make it their PhD thesis to actually take a look at it and tear it apart, and then you can get back the result and you can do better. That's really a very cool thing. Which leads me to one of the key things that I want to get across as, the, as, I'm, as, I'm, as, I'm, as I'm at the very end, which is the assessment problem that I have and that I think many people have. If I look at those algorithms, I look at a paper that really looks great, right? It has lots of math symbols, and it's really, you know, it's, it's typeset beautifully. Um, it looks like a real computer science kind of thing, but, you know, even though I am or used to be a computer scientist a long time ago before I did practical things, uh, it leaves me really at, at a loss to make up my mind, right? Is this just, you know, a really cool, scientifically peer-reviewed scientific paper, or is it just marketing done by somebody who knows how to use tech? I, I can't tell. Right, which is why I think this is extremely important to rely on the scientific stuff here. Right? You have to only, can only trust people who go public about that. It's like with, with any kinds of security-based things. Don't trust anybody who hides it and claims this is great. And recent examples that I found of this are probably very cool or very stupid. I have no idea. Hashgraph, for example. That's a patent, patented thing. company has like 20 million venture capital funding. They have a fantastic website, looks awesome, great-looking white paper, serious-looking CTOs, and, you know, I, I have no idea. This is cool. I, I, who knows? 
avalanche. It was dropped by an unnamed team. It's Team Rocket it is what it says. Looks very cool. It's sort of, there's a gossip kind of thing like Hashgraph. has a very simple algorithm. Looks beautiful. Again, I'm, I have no idea. I'll, I'll wait a while. I, I, I want to see some papers debunking it and somebody defending it, and then I make up my mind. Right? One company that I think does a good job is called I IOHK. They do something called or Ouroboros. The, the, the Cardano people, I think, they are very open and they're very scientific about the whole thing. But again, it's not supposed to be an endorsement because I don't know or don't really know them either. So that gets me to my summary. My summary of the whole thing is um, proof of work sucks and works. Right? So nobody likes it. Nobody thinks it's really fantastic. But at the moment, it's the only thing that is trusted with a few hundred billion dollars and hasn't been broken in a decade. That's a lot for it. Right, so I don't, I don't think we can discount it yet, and I'm sort of in the middle between this, these two energy uh, extremes. I also think that it's really hard to take a look at the stuff, and every time I see somebody claiming, well, they found something that is the future, right, like um, step away, blockchain, here's X, I'm kind of, nah, that, you know, that kind of marketing pisses me off. I don't want to look at that, I, I don't even want to look at that. Right? It makes me angry, I want to see scientific rigor and, you know, really, really strong a strong analysis of those things. So, science may help. Um, or science works, bitches, if that's what you prefer. That's all I have. Thanks a lot for listening. <laughs> Maybe just, excuse me, I'll publish the slides and there's a bunch of references at the end, right, so where you can read all that stuff. So, yeah. so uh, thank you, uh, Stefan. Um, we are over time, but there is only one question, oh, so maybe good. you want to uh, answer that one. So currently, most of the crypto coins follow similar architecture. One long block, which by definition makes stakeholders compete with each other to be able to write on it. What do you think about the DAG implementations, for example, Yota or Nano? Yeah, yeah so I I Yota, I think, is one of them that, was, that had a lot of criticism from the scientific community, and they handled it very badly. So maybe I, I have some sort of trust issues with Iota. But Hashgraph, for example, is also a DAG. Thing, right? So if that's what you prefer, then Hashgraph is maybe something you want to look at. And I'm pretty sure there are tons of others as well. Again, I'm not, I'm, I don't feel, feel I'm, that I'm qualified to really give, a, give an, um, a, a, a good opinion here, but uh, definitely take a look at that as well. Okay. So Thanks. thank oh, you very much. This one. Sorry. Afterwards. <laughs>